So when I started learning programming, I was using the C programming language, and I always got confused with the ampersand, which is the reference operator, and then how to get values out of that thing, of the address of that thing, uh, with a dereference operator, which is the asterisk. So Rust has something very similar, um, and it actually involves a trait called the uh, deref trait. So we're going to take a look at that today in our episode. My name is Ricky, and welcome to The Dev Method. The deref trait provides Rust with the info that it needs to be able to customize the dereference operator, the asterisk. So yeah, when I was learning that C programming language, I couldn't get the symbols or the characters on in the syntax. Like, I couldn't, I couldn't understand them. So hopefully this helps you today when dealing it with Rust. And I have a little uh, analogy I'll show you. We're also going to walk through um, some of the different rules and like defer coercion toward the end of the video. I'll leave links in the description to all the references to the other parts of the Rust programming book that is referenced in this chapter for the Rust programming book. All right, so let's get started. I'm going to remove this little bit of code, put in an example for us. All right, we'll start with this little part up here at the top. Uh, we might get some syntax errors as we uh, paste in this code, but no worries. I'm going to walk you through it. So uh, here on line uh, six, we're going to start with a value five, and it uh, goes into X, and this is an I32. All right, so now what happens when we do the ampersand, which is kind of like, a reference to X. Uh, we're going to put it into Y. So what does Y look like? Well, this is what Y looks like. It has the ampersand and I32. So on line 9, where we do an assert equals, all we're just saying is like compare the two together and make sure they're the same. So when we do that straight 5, which is an I32, we're looking at something that's also I32 and X. But now if we did it with Y, uh, that's actually an ampersand uh, I32 and then just a regular I32. So that actually doesn't work. Um, so if we were to run this, we would see some issues. So what we do instead is we actually use this asterisk to dereference what's the stored value inside of Y, which is going to be an I32. And then we're going to get that comparison here to be all good. So it'll be 5. So here's my example below of a door. So I always think of this five as like the underlying value. But if I'm making a reference to that underlying value, it's like hidden behind this door. And then the way I think of this asterisk here, I think of it like a little keyhole. You have to like use this to get into the door. You have to like unlock it. And then you can get the, uh, the value that is unlocked. So again, um, this the same as before, but now I just renamed some of the variables from up above so you can understand where the issues might be. So actually, let's run this and let's see what the uh, compiler tells us is wrong with this code. All right, so cargo run, which will build it, and tell us that it's no good. So here is the issue that we have. Um, so we're trying to compare an integer with a reference to an integer. So that actually doesn't work. And so that's our issue. Now, uh, this part here where it uh, says it's unlocked, I dereferenced it a second time. So that's actually incorrect. So let me get rid of that. Um, and then I can fix that error there. Now, I'm going to comment out these lines so that everything's all good. And the Rust compiler will be satisfied. OK, so again, made the changes, cargo run. Nice, there we go. Everything's working. Everything's good to go. So we've done this with an I32, but uh, in the previous video that I have, we were talking about boxes and how they're uh, pointers to values that are actually stored on the heap. So let's look at an example with box. All right, so just like before, we have x assigned uh, to the value 5, so that's an I32, right? Now we're creating a box. And so that box gives this uh, new is like how I put something in a box. And we're putting x into the box, and then we get y. And what is y? Well, it's a box of i32. And we actually can dereference it in the same exact way we did just the regular i32, but now it's inside of a box. 
Now, uh, the biggest difference here with the previous example is not just because we're using a box and the box is stored on the heap, um, but that uh, the box actually points to a copy of Y, not the actual value of Y. So that's the key difference here. And just a sanity check, I'm going to run this uh, as well. So I'll just do cargo build. Cool. Cargo run. Everything's running just fine. All good to go. Now, again, we're going to go a step further and let's write our own box. We'll call it my box. And let's just see if we could implement the deref trait ourselves. For this example, I'm going to start on line five here. This is the box. And this is a, a tuple type that's, you know, uh, a struct here. And uh, then we have our implementation. So we're kind of making the same code that we had from before. So we got the new, and then here's the box. And this is what the code will look like with the my box. Now we actually have an issue with this. So let's see what this says. Okay, so it tells us um, that it cannot be dereferenced box. And if we want a full diagnostic, we can check there too. But let's run it on the command line. We'll get a, a very verbose output. Cargo build. Nice. Okay. Cannot be dereferenced. More explained here. Um, but I think what um, we want to do is we want to implement the deref trait in order for this uh, syntactic sugar to work for us. I'll tell you why it's syntactic sugar toward the end. So now we want to treat my box, but as something that implements the deref trait. So let's get to it. So on line 15, I have this uh, use statement here so we could get a, uh, the symbol of deref and then implement it for my box. We'll implement it for my box here, okay? Now, um, there is an associated type uh, with this because the my box has a generic here. And uh, we're just gonna put that to target. So target's part of the deref. Uh, there's more detail on that in chapter nine the Rust programming book, and you can go look in the description now for a link to that section that, or that chapter that talks about that if you want to review or get more advanced. Uh, but the next part here is let's look at this signature. So we do have uh, deref here, right? So that's, that's actually like the method that gets called when we use that asterisk on that type. So uh, it passes in uh, a reference to self, yeah? And then we actually need to return a reference to the target. So this capital S self colon colon is just a fancy way to ensure that we're referencing this target that is part of uh, the deref associated type. Now we return the value that we want as a reference. So there's more details about that um, in a link in the description below if you want to see more about something like this with uh, tuple types and how you do the the dot zero to reference just the first thing in the tuple. And just to show you, that's just T. But that's our simple example. So now if we go back down to the main function here, and just look at it, uh, here's my new box. Now I will not have the issue that I have before. So we can dereference like before. So let's rerun this and let's see if we satisfied the constraint that we needed. And let's see if the assertion uh, passes. So cargo run builds, everything checked out, we are all good. So now let's talk about this concept of the implicit deref coercions on functions and method parameters. So I'm going to read you verbatim what it has in the book. Uh, it says, deref coercion converts a reference to a type that implements deref trait into a reference to another type. I'll let that sink in for a second. So here's our example. Uh, if we had a reference to the capital S string, um, we could actually coerce it to a lowercase str, a reference to that. So deref coercion is actually performed by Rust. So I mentioned there's this syntactic sugar. So this is actually what's happening here. Um, so Y is actually calling deref. So this code's running here and returning the, uh, the target there. And then we're dereferencing that. So that's that's the syntactic sugar that's going on. So this comes into play. Uh, this is like what happens behind the scenes. So you don't have to actually write this code this way. 
So a second ago, when I talked about like the capital S string going to the string slice here, uh, this is kind of what I'm talking about. Um, so like, let's just, we have this like simple function called hello, um, and it actually takes that lowercase uh, slice type, right? Whoops, I have to uh, get my box code in there. And now let's jump down to line 33 where we're using um, the my box. And uh, we actually put in a capital S string. Okay, so this is uh, the box, the M is a my box of capital S string. Now we pass it into hello, but hello wasn't actually the my box of string, right? So there's this um, implicit coercion that's going on. Um, so Rust is already picking up on a couple things here. So Rust can turn the, uh, the reference to my box of string into just a reference to the string. That's kind of cool because of the deref that we implement. Yeah, so that's what's happening here. And then because we can convert the uh, capital S string into a string slice, that's actually happening for us automatically too. So I have that example down below here. So here on line 40 is what's actually happening behind the scenes. Um, but I have the, these broken out into two parts. So first is just uh, what's in the parentheses there, the asterisk M. So this dereferences the my box of string into string. So we get that part done. Then uh, what's happening further, because you know this really cool implicit coercion that's happening, um, the ampersand, and then this part here, which is just taking the full like string as a string slice. See, it takes the capital S string, it makes it equal to the whole string, but now it's a string slice. That's how we get a string slice. Uh, that's how it can pass it into hello. So these two things are both equivalent. Now the line 44 is definitely harder to read than what we have on line 35. So it's hard to read, hard to understand. It's a little advanced and complex to look at, but um, Rust figures this out for us. It does it as far as it can go, and it's all done at compile time. So that's great. Thank you, Rust. Um, and then there's no runtime penalty for any of this, too, because this is just how it's uh, slapping in these replacements here for us. So that's the idea, and that's how you want to think about it. So, so far, we've been talking about like immutable references to these variables, uh, but we have to take immutability into account. So we're going to talk about um, how defer coercion interacts with mutability. So I'm going to pop up uh, some stuff on the screen here to show you. Um, but we have uh, three points to look at, or three things, three uh, like rules that we should think about. Uh, before I introduce the rules, I just I want to introduce you to this other trait, which is a deref mute trait. And that is used to override the dereference operator for mutable references. So here's the first one. Um, you have uh, a reference to T, and you want to go from T to U. And you can do that because T implements deref, and the target is the U. So that's our like capital S string example that we just went through going to a string slice works. Now, what if you want to go from uh, something that's a mutable reference to T to a mutable reference of U? So that would be like a mutable string to a mutable string slice. So that would work as well. And those two are very easy to understand because they're like for like matches. Now the last one's a little bit trickier. So the last one is a mutable reference to T goes to just a reference to U, a mutable reference to U. So the last combo that's missing from this list is something that is uh, immutable going to mutable. So that's not something that we could do and the borrow checker doesn't allow that in Rust. It's, just something that's impossible to do in Rust. And this is because Rust cannot guarantee that that one immutable reference is the only reference that actually exists in your program. So it just, it just can't guarantee it. Just can't do it. So check out some of the other videos that I have before, maybe data types to talk about string slices. There's a strings video as well. So they're in the Rust playlist if you guys want to take a look at it. Um, otherwise, Thanks for watching and, uh, you know, subscribe if you want to see more videos like this and uh, have a good one.